just wait for that to commit. Okay, so thank you. Welcome everyone that's turned up in person. Thank you guys. Um, and in all the other libraries and online at home, it's awesome to see so many people out and about and uh, us getting back to normal. Thank you. My name is Angela. I work here at Woodcroft and I've got Carol with me. Carol Baxter, the history detective. Um, Hi there. <laughs> and so if you want to ask questions from home or at one of the other libraries, you can pop it in the Q&A or in the chat and I will ask a series of questions to Carol and then um, I'll ask any other questions I see that float around. I'll be recording this session, as I just said, so it'll be on our website and I can email everyone a link if that's useful. Um, so Carol is the author of many books. I was trying to work out how many books you'd um, done. I thought it was about 12, but I didn't want to embarrass myself by saying 12. So I think it's probably lots more. And you've written lots of articles too. So <laughs> that's, yeah. So how many have you written? Probably lots. <laughs> Well, I've, in terms of books, because I edited a whole lot of books through my job um, in the genealogy project, I think um, I think if we can include include those in family histories, I've written them up to about twenty four. <laughs> okay, well, I have three of them here. Probably a bit hard to see them only because I've got a background on, um, but there is not. They, they are in our library system, so you can place them on hold. Um, and yes, they're very good. I have had a read of them for everyone here. Um, <laughs> So, Carol, it's hard to know where to start today because you've done lots of interesting things. You've, you started your career as a project officer, um, editing historical records. You've studied and you've done lecturing. You've delivered lots of seminars, speeches, and you've even done that on international cruise ships, which I thought that's like a dream job for lots of people. Uh, <laughs> and you've done on online webinars and things like what we're doing today and you've got an amazing website we're full of resources and of course you've written lots of books so my first question to you is how did you get so interested in genealogy and would you like to tell the audience a bit about yourself well my journey really it's funny how you can pinpoint a time in your life when everything changed and funnily enough it was when I was in year nine or ten let me turn that off I didn't think hold on that, am I still going to be here? Yes. <laughs> Get rid of that. Um, funnily enough, uh, it was when I was in year nine or ten when the we studied the book The Daughter of Time by Josephine Tay as part of our English courses. And, you know, people always go, oh, the books you study at school, they're so boring. Well, this was just fabulous. And it was the story of King Richard III and the Princes in the Tower. And it was written in a really clever way, whereas the detective was in a hospital bed and he um, was ill, couldn't do anything, flat on his back. And so a friend of his brought in a whole lot of pictures of famous people and asked him, asked him the question of should they be on the bench or in the dock? Should they be judging the other person for a criminal act or had they committed a criminal act? And one of the people was King Richard III. And he looked at the guy's face and he said he should be on the bench. But, of course, we believed he killed the princes in the tower. History believed it. And so she explored the story through, through having this guy, the detective in the bed, and another person doing the research. And the results of the research came through in a conversation. So it was a clever way of communicating research results. And I was fascinated by it. Um, and the teacher actually had us do a sort of a, uh, the idea was it, be, it was a, uh, did he do it, didn't he do it sort of question. But of course, the other person, I was leading one team and then the other person leading the other team was a 15 year old guy. And you can imagine what they were like, you yeah, know, not interested. So the whole thing didn't work. But that moment changed my life and it gave me a fascination for historical research. But what does a 15 year old research? And I started, I figured, well, the only thing to research was to trace my family history. So that's what got me going. So it was the fascination with the research process and the idea of determining historical truth. Uh, solving problems, detective hunt, jigsaw puzzle, all of those things, putting those things together. And the medium became the family history research. So it's probably not surprising that over the years I ventured 
out of that field because it was the research, the hunt that interested me, not necessarily the family, but the family was a wonderful vehicle for starting the hunt. Uh, and, you know, I ended up, it's funny, I through the genealogy, I've ended up with seven or eight different career paths from that one hobby. I mean, who else can say that? Yeah, it's amazing. I know my daughter would be very jealous of that because she she would love to do what you guys you do. <laughs> yes, well, and, and even when I started, I wanted a career in genealogy, but this was the 80s. There were no careers in genealogy. And so I just sort of went to university and studied English. Don't know why. I actually majored in linguistics. And after I left university, I... Um, got job as media analyst, so crunching numbers for advertising, advertising programs within uh, companies like Australian Consolidated Press and News News Limited, and I I worked for one year doing it, and then I bought a one way ticket to the UK to do research and backpacked around Europe for a while, and then I headed to England. And I was by myself by that stage. So the only places I went to were places that I had to do family history research. So I became an expert very, very quickly on, on researching in Australia and in the UK. And then about a year after I got back, I, was, I hated my job. And I sent my brother down to the careers section of Macquarie University, which is where I got my degree. And he brought home the careers newsletter. And there in the newsletter was the job Um, being pitched for project officer for the Australian Biographical and Genealogical Record. Well, as you can imagine, I didn't sleep that night because it was my dream job. And because I was going away, I was the 19th of 19 people interviewed for the job. And before I left the room, I had the job. I was the only one with all the experience they needed. So they needed someone with uh, history, genealogy, early Australian history and they wanted computing skills and in my number crunching for the media analysis we'd use computers so you know I was pretty adept at that in fact um, IBM had wanted me as a systems analyst at one point which didn't interest me at all I just went along for the job for the experience but I had that ability and so that got me the job and I ended up only finally quitting that job last year when I I badly broke my arm, I shattered my arm, and I I actually couldn't do the database work anymore. I couldn't drive for a year and it's still a mess. But so I really worked worked this for a bit. I won't even count the time, but it's a very long time. Oh, that's excellent. Um, Tell us a bit about your employment in the genealogy industry. I know you've just said a little bit about it. And working as a writer, how it was? Well, starting with the genealogy industry, the project was set up as a bicentenary project with the idea of ge- using computer computers to generate biographies of everyone who was in the colony before 1841. And that time frame was set because 1840 was the end of convict transportation to New South Wales and 1841 there was a census. So that was the time frame. And so in that role, I edited transcriptions of a whole lot of early colonial records. And anyone who's done New South Wales research would probably recognise them because they're in bright red. I chose that colour. So uh, so in, in that role, I learned about a lot about the records, but I also learned a lot about the individuals in the records to the point that people would mention mention early Australians and I'd go oh yes so and so you know I know all about him and that are quite shocked I could have this knowledge about you know people who were really quite obscure in many ways so I worked on that project um it didn't they didn't get the bicentenary funding they needed but we did a whole lot of putting out all these volumes and things and then the project ultimately morphed in what into what became known as the biographical database of Australia which is now an online project a non-profit project and I was general editor for that project and edited a lot more records so again you can imagine having a paid job where if you came across information about your own ancestors, and I have a couple of first fleeters and convicts, you could look at it because it was part of your job. So it was just wonderful. So I worked in that um, industry, as I said, until recently. And what I also researched my own family history and was writing family histories, started doing that 
really um, late 90s, early 2000s. And I decided in the year 2000 that I was going to get my first fleet ancestors story written up. And I thought it would take three generations. I thought it would take about six months. But I ended up researching uh, all the children and all the grandchildren in an attempt to find out more information about the children of the First Fleeters. Unfortunately, my own lot had 11 children and the sister had 13 children. So between it, I wrote 29 detailed biographies and the book ended up being nearly 500,000 words. Now, oh, the average oh. novel is 100,000 words and it was a kilo and a half thick. So, you know, it was enough to send you asleep if you um, fell, at, fell to bed or knock you out, actually, if you, you were reading it in bed and it fell on you. So while I was doing that with an ancestor's cousin's husband's father, I, I always research distantly because you never know what you're going to find, which is a good reminder to anyone doing their family history research, explore every lead, just as a tip here. I discovered the story of a political sex scandal in New South Wales in 1829. And I thought, oh, this is a pretty good story. Mm, I finished the family history. Maybe I'll tell that story. Maybe I'll try and write it as popular history. I knew nothing, although I'd, I'd been in the publishing industry and that we'd edit, I'd edited all these books, I didn't know anything really about the publishing industry as a whole, the mainstream publishing industry or anything like that. But I figured I was a great researcher and I could write okay. And why not give it a go? I was always up for a challenge. So one day I was up at the clothesline bringing in the dreaded washing and I had an epiphany. I realised that it was like a, a, a person doing a documentary. So you had the narrator at the front of the screen talking to the audience and they were, there were some characters at the back of the screen and they were slightly out of focus. And you could sort of see what they were doing and you could see that they were talking to each other. But it wasn't clear. Instead, the narrator was at the front of the screen telling you what those characters were saying or doing. And I thought, no, I don't want that. I want to boot the narrator off the screen and let the characters live and breathe and tell their own story. So I went back into the study and rewrote it. And it was a major change in my ability to write. So when I'd, I actually hadn't finished the, the manuscript because I had, by the way, a book isn't a book until it's published. It's called a manuscript. I hadn't finished the manuscript and I had sections that said, research to be done in the UK, but I figured I was close enough to finishing it and I was going to get rejected by two dozen publishers as one does. So I might as well start off by pitching it to the first publisher. And when I got the rejection slip and found out what they didn't like about it, I could tweak it and then keep working on it. So I sat on the floor of the Borders bookshop, that wonderful bookshop, if only it still existed, and I looked through the history section to see who was publishing Australian history and Alan and Unwin's name kept coming up and up. And so I got home and I Googled it and I found that it was an Australian publisher, tick, which also meant they were publishing a lot of Australian history, tick. So I decided to send the manuscript to them. One person, I later found out that it normally takes six to nine months to hear that you've been rejected. Instead, I got a phone call two weeks later to say they loved it and they ended up picking it up and publishing it. The problem is I, at that point I then suffered from um, imposter syndrome. If you've ever heard of that syndrome, I wasn't a writer. How could I get picked up by a mainstream publisher who offered me a lot of money, what's more, to publish it? How, how had I suddenly become a writer when I hadn't gone through the process of all the rejection slips? You know, it was just too, it was too easy. It was wrong. And so I felt like a fraud and I felt like the, the fraud police were going to come and get me, particularly when I was, people started to ask me to teach them how to write. But gradually it took a couple of years and then I, I really did realise I could write. Uh, and my, it's funny, my publisher said that I came in at a very high level in terms of the writing. And another tip to anyone who wants to write a book, it's because I was a reader. 
my record is four books in a day. And I had an awful headache at the end of the day. They, I think most of them were Dick Francis books. I really love Dick Francis books. But when you read a lot, particularly when you read a lot of fiction, you absorb structure, narrative voice, narrative arc, dramatic tension. You absorb all of those things and you can um, turn it into your writing almost by osmosis. If you let that if you let that come out in your writing rather than try and adhere to some dry sort of writing that you think you should write rather than the writing that other people want to read. Yeah, I, I um, this book particularly, I was very interested in, uh, in here how you talked about um, describing the characters, even to the shape of their face and really bringing them alive which I thought was really interesting and when you talk about publishing your book you talk about the font size and the the typeface and everything so it was quite in depth and I hadn't really thought about like I'm not a writer obviously I read like you but I take in all the detail of the character but I you're taking in but you don't realize that you that someone's describing it almost it's a weird thing but you. It, it, it's your it's the principle of what's called show not tell so when most people are writing their family histories they write in the encyclopedia style and they feel that they can't include any of their own thoughts or emotions or anything in it as starters and so they just stick to the facts but the facts really aren't necessarily facts. I mean, someone could have made a typo when they were putting the date in a record or something. It's the reality of the experience that people need to bring to life. And one of the examples I use is a ship crossing the ocean. The ordinary family history right, historian writing in the encyclopedia style will stick with the dates and the places. And, and if they um, write about the places, they'll put the date when the ship arrived and then maybe the size of the population and when it was settled but what brings it to life for the readers is if you think about the five senses what the person sees hears smells touches and tastes they're the realities of the experiences so you think of the color of the water the smell of the salt air the creaking of the sails the cursing of the sailors they're the real realities bring that to life in your writing and that brings the experience to life for the reader where the facts just send you to sleep so you almost have to you build up the scenes when you're writing and those facts are just the little prequels and sequels that that go between see the scenes so it's it's taking a quite different focus and how on earth I worked all of this out is beyond me I don't know in fact it's very embarrassing but I didn't even know what genre I wrote in until my publisher happened to mention it one day that I was writing narrative nonfiction. Oh, oh, am I? Okay. And I didn't know what an epigraph was, which is the quote under a chapter number. I mean, I knew what it was and I loved epigraphs, but I didn't know the name until at my first meeting with my publisher, she mentioned something about epigraphs and I was too embarrassed to say, what's an epigraph? So I, I thought that's what she was probably referring to, but I went home and looked it up in the dictionary. So I sort of, I, I learnt by doing but I didn't know what I was doing. So I had to learn what I was doing as I went along. And I remember when Breaking the Bank got first place in a um, Society of Women's Writers nonfiction prize, the, the, the judge said that I was writing in the active voice narrative of history rather than the passive voice narrative. And I thought, oh, oh, am I? Okay, that's, that's good to know. And then when I was reading another book, uh, it was about perspective and person and point of view and I realized I write in the close third point of view which is how fiction writers write but I don't make it up my writing is not faction I don't make up dialogue I might don't make up description if I want to know what the weather's like I've got to research it so it's probably the hardest genre to write in because you've got to take all these facts and make them interesting but by building up 
in that way, you can actually do something that, that's very interesting and, and it's different and people want to read it. So it all comes back to this showing rather than telling, showing the scene through the senses rather than telling the audience or the readers the fact through the numbers and the, you know, the dates and places and things. Um, we have a, in the chat someone um, has said, hi, Carol, Sheree Weekly from Lancaster, Pennsylvania here. It's 12.30 in the morning over there. Um, yeah. so we have some eager beavers online as well. So, yes, hi, Sheree. <laughs> um, what inspired you to write your first book? Because you obviously you've done lots of other things before that. Well, it was that moment when um, I realised the sex scandal would be something that might interest people. People in South Australia wouldn't know the name, but in New South Wales, there's a big law firm called Malison, Stephen and Jacques, if it still, if it still exists under that name. And the Stephen family were very, very big in the legal scene in Australia. They almost had it wrapped up. The father came out and was one of two Supreme Court justices. One of the brothers ended up becoming Lieutenant Governor of New South Wales. Another brother was Supreme Court Justice in uh, New Zealand. So this was a very important family. And then there was the black sheep of the family, John Stephen Jr., who was an adulterer and a bezler and you name it. And he had an affair with this convict woman. And the consequences were pivotal in New South Wales history because it was so, the political scene at that time was so tense that if basically, if you look at a member of the Liberal Party and a member of the Labor Party were siblings and they passed each other in the street, they couldn't talk to each other because it was that tense. So Jane Yu was the name of the character and she pranced onto the scene, beautiful, beguiling, bewitching. And all these men tried to use her and one by one they got destroyed, which is uh, so often is not what happens. The Me Too movement shows that. And so I love the fact that this female convict going her innocent ways, not that I could actually call them innocent at all because she was a cunning shoplifter, uh, she might somehow manage to turn the tide on these men and also change the course of history. And it led, it pushed the colony to the brink of a constitutional crisis and led to some legal cases that were quite pivotal in terms of the Masters and Servants Act and how you could treat convicts and things. So it was just such a great story and it became even better the more I researched it. I just thought it was a good story to start, but the more I did, the better it became. And out of that story, one of the things she did is she gave some information about a bank robbery. And I thought, what bank robbery? So I started, we didn't have newspapers online in those days, so I couldn't just Google bank robbery. So I went back through the online, uh, through the microfilms of the newspapers from the date when she gave the information. And I went back three months to, well, three or four months to August, September, 1828 and discovered the biggest bank robbery in Australian history, that thieves who were convicts tunnelled through a sewerage drain into the vault of the bank and stole the equivalent in today's terms of about $20 million. And I thought, there's my next book. And I started that four hours after handing over the manuscript for the first one. I went to the shops, came back home and started the next one. And the third one is called Captain Thunderbolt and His Lady. And I mentioned that in that same family history I wrote, the Nash, the first fleet of family history, because my ancestors ended up heading north to the uh, New England district and Thunderbolt roamed up in the New England district and there were some events going on around the time that the family were there. So at the time, the reason I started that one was because my publisher said, you know, what are you interested in writing about now? And I said, mm, I wasn't sure that I'd, I'd spoken at a family history or a historical society and someone was mentioning a bushranger, female bushranger, but they wouldn't tell it tell me who it was because they had their dibs on that. And she said, no one has their dibs on anything. And anyway, they wouldn't write history like you do. So go for it. So I Googled female bushranger and found Mary Ann Bug. 
and she was the lover of Captain Thunderbolt. And I, I emailed my publisher uh, about 20 minutes later and said, I found the story. I'll I'll send in a a submission, a pitch submission. So I got the contract. Interestingly enough, the actress Miranda Taxel has optioned that with a view to making a television series called Thunderbolt and Bug. So we'll see what happens when that comes out. The next one was a book called The Peculiar Case of the Electric Constable, and that was actually published in the UK. I was not responsible for the very weird title. My title was Caught by the Wires. And I mentioned that one in the same family history, the Nash family history. But the thing is, I didn't know anything about the story. It was just an ancestor's cousin's wife's husband's father, mother or something was a prostitute. And somebody came to her one day and gave her some money and it was stolen money. And the client had stolen it from his master, who was a Quaker called John Tall. And I just mentioned it in passing because she ended up being convicted, being sent to Brisbane and dying of an asthma attack of all things. How awful. Leaving her son orphaned. So it was relevant to the family history. After the family history came out, somebody said to me, did you know this man, John Tall, committed a murder that ultimately kick-started the communication revolution. It was the electric telegraph. No one was interested in the electric telegraph until he was caught by the wires, hence the, my title of the book. So that one, that's how that one came out. And so that's why, because the murder and everything happened in the UK, he was a convict to Australia, but it happened in the UK. That's why it was picked up by a British publisher. And the next one, I was interested in the story of uh, Louisa Collins, who was the last woman to be hanged in New South Wales. And I thought it would make a good story, but I didn't have a hook. And then the police, the police museum was doing an exhibition and they referred to her as her nickname, the Lucretia Borgia of Botany. And I thought, the Lucretia Borgia of Botany Bay brings in the whole sense of murder, crime, poisoning and the colony of New South Wales. So I pitched it under that title and got the contract. It, they ended up deciding to change the title to Black Widow, which was a much, much better title. My final one, The Fabulous Flying Mrs Miller, I, Alan and Unwin actually offered it to me. A man called Richard Walsh, who's big in the publishing industry, had discovered the story and decided I was the right person to write the story. And so they sent me an article about her offsider. Her name was Jessie Miller, nicknamed Chubby, though she was slender and small. And she was Australia's first internationally famous female aviator. But the, she was a friend of Amelia Earhart. She became very famous as an aviator in America. But the reason we don't know about her is because she became a central player in an American sex scandal and murder trial. So they gave me the details and I didn't know half of what it was because I had to research that. It was just about the, the male aviator. And I said to them, I would sell my soul for this story. They liked my enthusiasm. So I got the contract and that came out a few years ago and that is being made into an international TV series called The Aviatrix. It's got one of the producers, was one of the producers of Lion, the movie about the little Indian boy who got lost and was nominated for six Academy Awards and one of the directors, well, the director for the first three episodes was a director of The Witcher, which is the TV series that the young people who love the Game of Thrones. This one is probably 95% likely to happen. They've been working on it for four years and what I've read sounds brilliant. So that's that's my career in a nutshell. Welcome, Pia. Yeah. Uh, that's um, very interesting because all your titles are just so fantastical. <laughs> well, um, the, fa the fabulous flying Mrs Miller, I must admit, wasn't my choice either. That was my publisher. And because they offered me the book, they were the ones all along who picked the, went through four renditions or iterations of a title. So, but I like the alliteration in the fabulous flying Mrs Miller. So do, you, do you get any say about the titles or do you just go with what they suggest? 
the three things a mainstream author doesn't have much control over are the title, the cover, and the blurb. So okay. we tend to have to, if we've got a big complaint, obviously we'll listen, they will listen, but otherwise it tends to be pretty much up to them. And do you, what, how do you choose, like, how will you choose your next book? Like what well, subject matter will you do, you have? <laughs> it's funny you should ask that because Mrs Miller, I had, she was, I was in love with her. She was wonderful to write about. And she left interviews and she left articles she'd written about her adventures. So I had her thoughts and feelings and dialogue and all this sort of thing, which helped me really bring the story to life. And finding another story like that was going to be very hard. And then a couple of years ago, Alan and Unwin phoned me with another book idea and it sounded great. And I said, yes, and we were about to, to hand over the money, all of that contracts had been signed and I started doing some work on it and I realised that the narrative art wasn't there. Someone had self-published a book, um, it hadn't sold any copies, it re- wasn't very well known. You know, it had, got, had had a couple of interviews but it wasn't very well known. And But as it turns out when I tried to do the research, what the person seemed to have done was use family stories and they just were not supported by the evidence. To the genealogists out there, be very careful about family stories. People tend, based on their ego, to make them a lot bigger than they really were. And the woman had an, had a role in history. She was a footnote in history. It was her husband who was important. And I ended up saying, I just can't get a narrative arc out of this and it's basically not worth the money you were going to pay me. So I really can't do this. And they said, what else would you like to write about? Well, I had a great idea and initially they were saying no because someone else had done it and I said, there's all this material out. I'm not going to tell you who it is. There's all this material, new material out there since the book was written. So they decided they would be interested and then I shattered my arm. And so, yeah, that I mean, I was on opioids for two months. I couldn't drive for a year. It's still a mess. So everything went on hold with that. And also I was going to have to travel to England and it was COVID and, you know, I have some lung issues that mean it wouldn't be a good idea if I get COVID. So the whole thing went went quiet and I thought it had gone away. And then um, my, my publisher retired and a new one came on and she said, oh, Carol, you know, about that story. And suddenly they're interested again. But I've said, I have too much on my plate at the moment and I'll think about it in another year. So, you know, if everyone's sort of keen for me to do it, but I've just got to deal with myself at the moment. And um, I, um, when I, when I, the day before I broke my arm, I actually decided to set up a business teaching people how to write uh, what I, it's called writing fabulous family histories. So that kept me sane with the broken arm because I had other things to think about. So I also want to work on that as well because there's so much to teach people and I love the teaching process and I love I love crafting webinars and then I record these and it's a subscription website. So there's so much scope for helping people and not just for for writing a book because when when I write a book, it's a total immersion. I mean, fabulous by Mrs. Miller, I work seven days a week for a year. So you can, it's, it's burnout material. So once you're back in the zone, it's hard to get out of it. So anyway, book writing will wait till next year. Meanwhile, I'll continue talking and, you know, preparing my courses and other things. Well, your website is, you can get lost in it, that's for sure. You've got lots of stuff on there um, to keep you busy. <laughs> yeah. uh, I have a question here that what has been the most interesting, surprising or horrifying thing you have uncovered in your research? Well, okay, so interesting was that the stories of murderers are not passed down through the family. Isn't that funny? (laughs) Are we surprised? No. Gee, my ancestor killed someone and he he or she was hung. Yeah, no, that didn't get passed down through the family. In terms of horrifying, I would probably think about the fact that executions in the past were public. People flocked from all over the country 
to attend what were known as the Hanging Games, which reminds me of the movie The Hunger Games. They, it was a sport. It was entertainment that you'd go to the executions and they wanted a good hanging. They wanted the person to be noble or whatever in the hanging. But, of course, what happened in the hanging, all the pickpockets and other thieves went around thieving and pickpocking and everyone got drunk in the aftermath. So it wasn't quite the message to people that you shouldn't commit crime. In fact, one of the most famous hangman, British hangman of all time, was actually executed for murder down the track. So it wasn't a deterrent in any way, shape or form. And another horrible thing I learned was the drop. So it was called when, when a person was hung, they had the rope around their neck. And the rope was positioned in such a way that there was not under the left-hand side, and the idea was the knot would break the neck. But, of course, the rope had to be the right length for the person to fall enough for there to be enough momentum with the gravity to, to have that effect. And if the rope wasn't long enough, they strangled to death, and if it was too long, they were decapitated. So they had to work all of this out. I mean, it was you know, cruel and unusual punishment, but, of course, they didn't consider it that really because the person had committed a crime and they considered it just. But you've got to remember, the crime might have been wearing a black face at night because that suggested you were a poacher or cutting down a tree in an avenue. It was a horrible, not a street, but an avenue because it was a portal to the gentleman's estate. I mean, there were 220 crimes punishable by death or something like that. So you could have an absolutely horrible hanging for something that today is little more than a misdemeanor. If that, I mean, a blackened face is nothing. So I think it was the horribleness of crime and punishment in the past and how people still, strangely enough, think that, that hanging, the death penalty is a deterrent. It's not. It actually makes things worse. It doesn't make things better. Crime is worse in places that have the death penalty, as counterintuitive as it might seem. So there's some of the horrible things I've learned. Okay, I have a question here from Carolyn. Hi, Carol. Can you can you tell us more about your writing process and how each book is how long each book has taken to write? Okay, that's actually a good um, a good introduction to a concept I talk about called mind combine and refine. When three processes is in writing anything, so. The mining part is the researching part. We mine the records to get the information. Then we have to combine the information about the individuals with other historical records, context sort of in information. So we bring all of that together to, to write interesting, well, to write it into a prose format. Then we refine it. So that, that's the combined process. Then we refine it. We polish the prose to make it something readable. Now, this might seem like a chronological process, but it actually isn't. Most people think of writing book as a process of planning what you're writing. But there are two types of writers. There are planners. Or there are people like me who are called pantsers, P-A-N-T-S-E-R. Basically, we fly by the seat of our pants. I start researching something. So, so for example, with Mrs. Miller, I got a three and a half A4 page article, primarily about her aviation partner and lover, Bill. And that was the material I had to start writing this book. So I took something from that and I started doing the research and then I wrote it up and I often polished it if it was pretty good. Then I found another bit and I researched that and I wrote it up and sometimes again polished it. And the whole book gets built up in these different stages based on whatever I feel like writing about at the time. It's not based on a chron chronological procession because that's not how I research. But somehow it all ends up that way as part of the refining process. I go back and I move things around and make everything logical. But the good news about this for researchers and writers is you do not have to have a plan when you start. You do not have to have done 
all of the research. In fact, what I would do is I would have a bit of paper or a computer Word file, and as I would do the research, it would be my to-do list. And I'd say, go to this library and look for this, do this. And it was only the process of putting the research onto paper via the keyboard that would get my brain to think about the next stage of the writing process. I could not plan out a book like I am doing because on three and a half pages, I ended up writing 175,000 words, which was cut to 110,000 words as part of the editing process. I had no plan. There were, there were a huge amount of things I knew nothing about when I started. And when my publisher ended up reading the manuscript, I'd get these phone calls of her saying, from her saying, Carol, you never told me about this, you know. And then the next day another phone call, I can't believe it, I can't believe it, you never mentioned this because I kept on finding this as I researched and then that led me to explore that topic and that, that gave me a new slant on the characters or on how I could, how I could structure the story if something was more important than something else I'd focused on. So, so it's... It, a lot of people have told me knowing that they don't have to be a planner, that they can be themselves and be a pantser is enlightening and um, inspiring for them as a writer because you can literally take any information you have got now, five minutes after this session is finished because it gives you time to have a drink and go to the loo, you can get any of that and literally start writing straight away. It doesn't matter how much you have done or not done. You can start writing straight away. And that is what then gets you to the next stage. The people who want to do all the research first and then start always have a brick wall ahead of them. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, another question here from Alex. Could you please repeat the name of the book that initially inspired your passion into genealogy? It's called The Daughter of Time. And it's by an author called Josephine Tay, T-E-Y. Incredibly enough, it was written in the 1950s, but I guess so was To Kill a Mockingbird, which is one of my favourite fiction books of all time. And another school text, funnily enough. So I actually got it on my Kindle a few years ago. I was curious to read it again after 40 years or whatever, and I thought it was as beautifully, by then I could appreciate writing in a way I, I couldn't before. And I thought it was beautifully written and well-deserved being a school text in the 70s. Mm. Um, one more question from Georgia. Uh, hi, Cal, did you ever think about using your research skills outside of writing or history? I have written a lot. Well, I've written a number of articles. Writing the power, the presentations I give, they're all crafted. But the big thing I have used it for is cruise ship talks. So I originally started out giving as uh, one of the speakers on genealogy, at genealogy conferences on cruise ships. Then when Mrs Miller came out, I was speaking at a lunchtime Sydney Harbour cruise. I mean, that's the life, isn't it? I was in conversation like with you, with a radio presenter who was hosting these lunchtime cruises. I mean, my idea of bliss. Mm -hmm. And I mentioned the fact that it was April and was getting a bit cold and I just said, and she apologised that, and I said, don't worry, I love being on a cruise, yeah, any sort of a, a cruise ship and I'd love to be a, a cruise ship speaker one day. Well, as it turns out, she had spoken on cruise ships, knew the head of a speaking agency, got in touch with them and said, you need to pick Carol up. So, um, so that's how I got my um, speaking, cruise ship speaking gigs. And what I found was one of the problems with writing a book is it takes one to two years to write. It's, it's the, research, the research for Black Widow I largely did in a few days. I spent $1,000 on photocopying in the State Library and then I was able to get some newspaper online or go in and look at microfilms, but I had all this research. It was then uh, producing the book and refining it, and the, refining it's obviously one of the most time-consuming books, making it the quality prose that a, a publisher would be interested in. So 
so, so the two year process, but if I do a cruise ship talk, I can do a subject that interests me in one to two months. So for example, there's a story, there's a wonderful story about a group of Irish Fenians who were transported to Western Australia. And Peter Fitzsimons wrote the story as a book called The Catalpa Rescue. And it was a story I would have loved to have written. So I started from scratch and redid all the research myself and made it into a gripping two-part cruise ship talk. And my cruise ship talks aren't lectures, they're stories. I'm a, I narrate a story. So unfortunately, they are fully memorised 40 to 45 minute talks. And my, the last cruise I did before COVID struck, I had to do seven of them. So I figure seven 40 to 45 minute fully memorised talks. So they performed, you know, my voice goes up if it needs to or down or faster or slower, you know, it's a performance. So, um, and so I had such a, a great time producing these and I thought I'd just keep going. The problem was that I then had to memorise them. And when COVID struck and we were in lockdown, I decided to, and I didn't have much work at the moment at that time because my bosses didn't have much money, I decided to do one on the Mary Celeste ghost ship. So if you've heard that, so I did that as a fascinating two-part talk, the first part being the uh, events that happened and then and the investigation afterwards, all of that. And the second part being the theories, covering all the theories until I eventually pretty much worked out what happened. Unfortunately, I haven't done a cruise ship cruise since where I got to speak on it. I've got about 14 of them now I've done. I can't memorise 14, 40 to 45 minute talks. So I stopped working on those, but I, I the next one I wanted to do was the Bermuda Triangle. So uh, another fascinating one even though most of it's myth, of course, rather than fact. But I really love doing it and then telling them as these stories. So the audiences, in fact, the last one I did, the um, entertainment director told me, you heard people saying that they wanted to find out what other cruise ships I was speaking on so they could book on those cruise ships, um, those, those, yes, and then COVID struck and everything went downhill. So they're some of the ways I have turned my writing through through talks, through the, the webinars or the, the online courses in my website and through cruise ship talks. Ultimately, all of this stuff comes down to the prose. And if you can write prose, you can do anything. Yeah. We've, we've got about 10 minutes left. So I've got another question from Bonnie. If you write... Um, a story that actually happened like a murder is there any do you have to be careful uh, about the descendants and can you be sued everything i do is long in the past so no if you were doing something now and you were quoting individuals or using information that they provided without permission or using pictures without permission then yes, you could get sued, but nothing historical, no. And if you stuck to the records with a uh, even a current current uh, story, if you stuck to the records and made it clear that if you were saying something perhaps out of the blue uh, that was a little bit odd, if you made sure you said things like "in my opinion," you can get away with it. But if you are if you are looking at doing that and you are interviewing people, it's really important that you have a legal document that they sign that releases you to use that information. I'm actually speaking next week, in, being interviewed by an international podcaster who has a uh, crime podcast, and I had all these things I had to read through and sign as to the rights of, you know, no, the, uh, no payment because there's no payment, but the rights of who holds the information, you know, a few pages worth. So it's really important that you, in that case, it's because it's their podcast. But if you're writing a story and it's somebody's story who's live now or whatever, you just have to cover yourself because for slander or libel or defamation. Yes, that is very true in today's market and world. You just market, yep. <laughs> what is your favourite book or author? In terms of narrative nonfiction, 
The Surgeon of Crowthorn by Simon Winchester. It was actually made into a movie a couple of years ago called The Professor and the Madman with Mel Gibson in it. And they actually did a really good job of the movie. But it is, Simon Winchester is a beautiful writer. And as far as I'm concerned, this is his best book. And it's only very thin. It's very easy read. It's probably about 150 pages. But it's the story of this American who is a doctor. And he's had a, uh, he had a very religious upbringing, which led to a strange attitude towards sex and his penis and things, and which he ended up cutting off. And he killed someone. It's two parallel stories, though. The other story is the story of the making of the Oxford English, English Dictionary, the most extraordinary dictionary of all time, which took about 50 years to make. So this, this Dr Murderer ended up in a equivalent of Bedlam in a, in a psychiatric hospital. And he was a contributor to this dictionary, but they didn't know at the time. So Simon Winchester has written this beautiful story with these two beautiful book with these two stories interwoven and in parallel and each set it shedding light on the other and it, it's a I highly recommend it as I do Josephine Tay's The Daughter of Time it's just such a beautiful story and how how you can tell a, a murder a, the story of a murder and make you make the reader so sympathetic and so involved and so rewarded at the end of it. Wow. That's great. Um, again, would you consider those stories that she did us on the ships as, as perhaps a volume of short stories? Did you hear that question? No. Um, would you consider the stories that you do on the ships to put like a short story, put it into a published short story? Oh, I'd never really thought about that. Probably no, because it's a whole lot of work and I've got enough on my plate. Uh, <laughs> Maybe when you retire. You could, retire? You could, what does that mean? <laughs> Me retire? No, I don't think so. You could do an anthology. <laughs> yeah. I, th I think probably if I could keep memorising cruise ship talks, I'd, I'd do more cruise ship talks so, so funnily enough you might be surprised cruise ship speakers actually have to pay to speak on a cruise ship you have to pay the agency generally oh. so um so it's there is a couple of cruise lines it's a free gig but mainly you have to pay the agency but let me tell you before crystal went down one of my most, most fun cruises was a crystal cruise which is six star from los angeles to auckland 12 speakers on it, you know, US four-star general, British sir who was advisor to two prime ministers, you know, war correspondent. I mean, I just went along listening to all the speakers and in 22 days I only had to speak three times. So it was, you know, it was brilliant cruise. I'd love to do those, but unfortunately they went bankrupt. Very sad. Uh, that's no good. Uh, we got more questions? Yeah. Just on the, the family history, Ryan, was she going to be doing any seminars? like in live or anything like that? She got anything planned in, in that sphere? Yeah, that's, um, have you got any more planned seminars about local uh, family history and things? Which one yes. of my last question is what, what's next for you? Well, um, I, I would recommend that everyone uh, access my website, which is www.writingfabulousfamilyhistories.com and you can then sign up to my newsletter and I then in that newsletter tell you what is coming. So for example about the 6th of July I'm working on a talk at the moment and I'll go back to work after this called The Madness of Max Surnames because one of the things I did at university was I majored in linguistics and I know all about the sounds and letters of surnames and then in my editing role I learnt more about them so to help people understand how to find we you know surnames starting with Mac. So I've got that I've, I've got about 11 talks this year so they will be all announced in the newsletter so in each of those talks takes me one to two weeks to prepare so they're actually a huge amount of work then there's the 
uh, preparing more courses for my writing fabulous family histories business. So I've got at the moment I've got um, a course that's called Words on the Page, which means getting the writing onto the page, and then one on surnames. But I actually use that to teach people how to write encyclopedia style writing in an interesting way because everyone has surnames they're researching even if they don't realize they're researching surnames surnames are the link that carries all the generations through and I'm always surprised that people ignore the origins of surnames when they're writing family histories because it's actually quite fascinating so I've got um I've got all of that on my plate and each course takes me about three months to prepare so so basically I can easily work 24 hours in a day and not have enough time to do everything. <laughs> yeah, do you need an assistant? <laughs> oh, yes, if only. Unfortunately, I'm in a world that doesn't pay very much. So if only. And, of course, I have this beautiful canal out there and um, all these people in the uh, – I'm in a gated community out there with a boardwalk between my terrace and the water, you know, which is 10. And they all walk past and people come over and have a drink and a chat and, you know, come out and, you know, come down and join the yacht club and all of this sort of thing. So I've got a social life for the first time in – 20 years because I was just writing or preparing talks or something and so um, so I've decided I am going to give myself permission to have weekends off which of course means when I'm bored um, I sit down and work on one of my talks so <laughs> I'm a sucker for punishment. <laughs> well that's amazing I um, I think we're at the end today so thank you for joining us I have Got some feedback from Son Candy, and she's and I couldn't have said it better. She said, "Hi, Carol. Hooray for us, Panthers! I love your webinars and the style of your um, doing it without knowing what you're doing in the your early days. You're a very inspirational writer and speaker, and you've given me a lot of motivation to continue with my writing. Thank you, come Candy. Oh, thank you, Candy. That's lovely." So I, um, it has been yeah, amazing to chat to you today. I was long awaited and very much looking forward to it. Uh, what I'll do for the audience and everyone at home, I'll email out um, a feedback form so everyone can give me feedback so that we can continue doing these amazing type things. And I'll include all the links to your website. So if you've got any links you want to include, if you send them to me and I'll, I'll just pop them in an email to everyone Terrific. Yes, well, that's that's always a good idea. And I, I hope everyone loved it. So I hope you keep getting the funding to do these because I think it's a great way for libraries to engage with their market. Libraries at one point were coming not obsolete, but, you know, people weren't using them as much. And of course, with Kindles, people often aren't coming to the libraries. So I love the way the libraries are coming out to the community now and doing so much more. And of course, COVID's been beneficial in so many ways in a really weird and, and, and an awful way. But the ability to do this sort of thing online, I, I think I'd only done one or two things online or, or apart from the international ones. Um, online before COVID, it was always live. So yeah, it's we just wonderful same. for all these. And, and there, there were then all the expenses involved in that. So this is just wonderful. So congratulations to you too for, for putting on these events. Thank you. I mean, as, as you just said, yeah, it's been a big learning curve for everyone um, to scramble with the technology. And we've been able to do so many more author events with people that don't come to boring old South Australia. <laughs> Lots of international speakers and stuff miss South Australia off um, their touring list. So it's been good that we can still do it online like this. So, so thank you very much. And I'll chat to you um, later in the week. Thank you for joining us today. It's been really good. Thank you, Angela. It's been lovely. Thank you. Bye.